Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. and welcome to the World Affairs Council's author series program held here in the, at the, it, with the cooperation of the El Salvador Embassy and His Excellency Francisco Fuentes. I want to thank the ambassador and his staff for their hospitality this evening. My name is Heidi Shoup and I'm president of the World Affairs Council in Washington and it's my pleasure to welcome you here and to begin this program. Diana Negroponte joins us this evening to discuss her newest book, Seeking Peace in El Salvador, the Struggle to Reconstruct a Nation at the End of the Civil War. An expert on public security and trade issues in Mexico and Central America, she is currently a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, where she created the Latin America Initiative in 2007. An international trade and aviation lawyer, she, she has taught courses related to Latin America at Fordham and Georgetown Universities. She served as country director for Honduras's World Relief Program and played an active role with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Mexico during the negotiations for the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. Her extraordinary voluntary efforts on behalf of social development in developing countries have won her international acclaim. In Honduras, she worked with displaced refugees and children with cancer, and in Mexico with Habitat for Humanity. International, where she helped to build low-income houses in city slums, and she initiated the Very Special Arts Program in Mexico to assist the artistic development of people with disabilities. She chaired the Salvation Army in the Philippines Red Shield Appeal in 1995, and served as a member of the Advisory Board of the Salvation Army in Mexico and in the Philippines. She graduated from the London School of Economics, received her Juris Doctorate from American University and a PhD from Georgetown, both here in Washington. She has been a member of the Council of Foreign Relations since 2005. Tonight, she joins us with her newest book, which looks at the U.S., Soviet, and internal issues and actions surrounding the resolution of the Civil War in El Salvador. It proved a difficult piece to keep, and it, this work questions how peace was made and what has been the outcomes. Joining Dr. Negroponte is Mr. Hector Silva, who serves as Deputy Chief of Mission here at the Embassy of El Salvador. Tonight, he will represent the ambassador, who unfortunately could not be with us this evening, and he will provide some comments following Dr. Negroponte's remarks. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Negroponte and then Mr. Silva. Twenty years ago, at this time, the warring parties of El Salvador made peace after 12 years of a civil war in which over 70,000 people died. And half a million moved, migrated, many of them coming to the United States. If we have the richness of a Salvadorian community in Northern Virginia today, it is in large part as a result of those who fleed the violence during that civil war. I feel that it's a great honor, <coughs> Minister Hector Silva, that you would invite an author who has come to love your country so much to share this story with such a distinguished group of people. The World Affairs Council comprises men and women intrigued and knowledgeable on foreign affairs. And tonight, in lieu of focusing on those issues of Iran and the Straits of Hormuz and Palestine and Hamas, you have chosen to come and learn, maybe debate, of a story that happened much nearer to home and which had a direct relationship on our lives. El Salvador, it's the size of Massachusetts, population somewhat larger and that is one of the issues which Salvadorians struggle with. 
There is very little fertile, fertile arable land for the many, many people who choose to live in this country. And the tension in search of land and the competition between landowners and those who worked that land may be one of the principal causes which over history underlies the conflict and the violence which is El Salvador's civil war. These are the issues that I want to address tonight. Peace was reached in the sense that a ceasefire was reached 20 years ago, January 1992. And it was reached with great fanfare in the uh, palace of Chapultepec in Mexico City. And the foreign ministers of the United States and Venezuela and Mexico and Panama all showed up to celebrate but the people of El Salvador were not there. They were back home, a country in which none of the negotiations had taken place. So when peace came, this appeared to be something which had been organized from outside. And their challenge, the challenge of the Salvadoran people was how do we make this work? How do we take this internationally mediated peace and make it relevant and workable for men and women in cities and the countryside and the farms all over the country, all over? And I would argue that El Salvador is at peace in the sense that there is no distinct <coughs> armies fighting each other. But Salvador suffers from thousands of young men and women who have formed these cliques or youth gangs which operate in the United States and whose headquarters may be with us or may be in Salvador, but their capacity to damage and to hurt in El Salvador is very serious. And the murder rate last year related to drugs, 4,308. And we have to ask how we can help the people of El Salvador in this great struggle that they now undertake. Jim? Quick one. Salvadorian army, 42,000 at this time, a major force in the country. Under the Constitution, it was a permanent institution and it had exercised a power which went beyond that of the civilian president. So if the violence was such, who were the parties fighting each other? The guerrilla forces were made up of five fighting groups and then one other political. And they were formed by many young men and women who had felt the brutality of the armed forces, and many of whom, in March 1980, were in the cathedral in San Salvador when the Archbishop Romero called on the army not to fire at fellow Salvadorians. And when the Archbishop called on the army, the soldiers, the foot soldiers, to in effect disobey their superiors and not shoot at fellow citizens. There were leaders who decided that he had to die. And they murdered him. But when they brought his body to that same cathedral for his funeral, and when hundreds of young men and women 
came up the steps of the cathedral and came into the church to pray and to cry and to remember. They were shot. The armed forces shot them. And so the memory of many is hiding under the pews, behind the pillars, or trying to flee as they were shot, gathered for his funeral. And so a fear created a cycle of violence in which the FMLN also murdered, kidnapped, and carried out brutal acts. There is no suggestion that it is only one-sided, except when the United Nations later published its report. The United Nations mediators concluded that 80% of the violence had been carried out by those armed forces. And therefore, the purging of those armed forces became a necessary part of that peace. I had a wonderful conversation with Julia uh, before we met today, in which I said the women fought so hard. They carried messages, they carried food, they cared for the sick, they cooked. But when peace came, those women returned to their families, returned to their homes, and they were absent in the implementation. And the question is, why were the strong, highly intelligent, dedicated women of El Salvador absent during the reconstruction of that nation? One or two of the great leaders had to go into exile as part of the peace agreement because she admitted to having planned the murder of mayors, city mayors. But otherwise, there is a real search for women who could have helped consolidate the peace. So I now go briefly over some of the leading characters. Jim, next one, please. Joaquin Villalobos, he wrote, he wrote. If Fidel Castro said that if, if, or if Joaquin Villalobos's words had been equal to the number of bullets he shot, no one would have lived. He wrote so much. And he had a radio show called Radio Venceremos. And likewise, he was articulate, he was there. But he, too, in the peace, admitted to having organized the murder of city mayors. And he, too, went into exile. He is now a don at Oxford University, an international advisor to the government of Mexico on how it should handle its violence. And the next photograph, please, Jem my friend with whom I spent several days at the Trilateral Commission in Toronto in November. He has now become an international statesman. But others are there. The next one, please. Shafi Kandal, the leader of the Salvadoran Communist Party, charismatic man, strong-minded. Bernie? Welcome. Would you please come to the front of the room before your photograph is put up on the screen? Bernie Aronson, who was the Assistant Secretary for American Regional Affairs and who is a key person in making peace in El Salvador. His pick comes up very soon, but it's not as good looking as the guy here. Wait till I tell about you. I got some good stories. Shafiq the young man, later Shafiq Handal, the candidate for president. He tried twice to be president of El Salvador, but he could not shake off that identity as the leader of Salvadoran Communist Party. And he never won. He died last year, Hector, or in 2010? 
28 he dies. A man who believed very much in his people. Next one. If I said that Bernie was a hero, there is another hero, and it is this man, President Christiani. He should have been a staunch conservative aligned with the landowners, with what is pejoratively called the oligarchy. But he and his fellow conservative, but moderate conservative businessmen, decided that they had a role to play in ending the war. Because neither their business flourished, nor foreign investment entered the country, so long as the assassinations continued. And when the founder of a right-wing party called the ARENA, A-R-E-N-A, realized the Americans would never let him be president, a younger man was chosen, Alfredo Cristiani. And Bernie, you not only went down to Salvador on several occasions, to show US support for Christiani, but I think there were some regular telephone calls on your part in different situations which we shall cover tonight. And I really do believe that without this man, peace would have come later. It would have been harder. The next one, Jim, please. If the war is going on and those contesting parties, the FMLN on one side, Christiani's government and the Arena party, November 1989 is a critical month for the reasons that I have put up on the board here. Fall of the Berlin Wall, a surge on the part of the FMLN to show their supporters that they could still assert their presence. They could still hold Salvador, San Salvador. But during the daytime, the armed forces would come out, would patrol city streets, would hold the city. And at nightfall, when the armed forces went back in their barracks, the FMLN came out. And they held sway, with the result that after three weeks it was clear there was a stalemate. Now, many Salvadorians will tell me I am wrong, that in fact the armed forces had the upper hand. But all my readings suggest that there was a stalemate. There was no way forward through violence. And the only way that could be persuaded was through negotiation. And again, another event takes place that November. The Jesuits play a very important role in Salvador. And six Jesuits who ran the University of Central America lived in their seminary when one night on November the 16th, a battalion went into their home, forced them all out of their bed, laid them down in the grass and shot each of them in the back of the neck. Went, then went in back into the seminary, into the room of the housekeeper and her daughter, and murdered them too. Those members of the battalion thought that no one had seen them. But the housekeeper's sister was in a nearby building. And through the drapes, she watched all that occurred in the garden with the Jesuits. She did not see what happened to her sister or her niece. And probably thanks to you, Bernie, this sister is brought to the US, is granted protection, and is allowed to tell her tale. Joe Moakley representing a strong Catholic constituency in Massachusetts, 
was horrified. And he determined on a congressional inquiry into who lay behind this attack on the Jesuits. Not just the soldiers who had entered and carried out, but the masterminds. And this begins the undoing of U.S. support for the Salvadorian army and its government. Bernie Aronson was called to testify before the Senate in the three days after the murder of the Jesuits. And I believe you were going up to seek an increased appropriation for the Salvadorian government, and John Kerry, Senator Kerry, was interested in only one issue. Who had murdered the Jesuits, and what were you, the administration, going to do to find out what lay behind. In the days that followed, Alfredo Cristiani, that man in the white guayavera that I talk so highly about, went silent. Instead, the US ambassador to Salvador, a man called Bill Walker, held daily press conferences seeking to show that the United States was determined to find out who had murdered, because it was evident that there would be no continued funding for the government of El Salvador, so long as the suspicion remained that, high, that senior people, maybe the Minister of Defense, maybe higher, had knowledge, had acquiesced, or had ordered this murder. Now enters a new player, because in this stalemate, combined with the uproar in the international community, there is an institution and one person with an eagerness to get involved, Alvaro de Soto. Mr. De Soto is Peruvian. He was very close to the UN Secretary General of the time, Javier Perez de Cuella, another Peruvian. Until now, the UN had never got involved in Latin American conflicts. There was a recognition that this was an area of US interest, and therefore the UN should stay out. But with the end of the Cold War, Alvaro de Soto, Jim, just go back one, would you would, <coughs> argued that this was a time for the UN to mediate a peace. Now, the bureaucrats on the 38th floor of the UN building in New York said, there's very little legal justification for us getting involved. And what happens if the Americans don't want us? They are the principal funders. Do we dare aggravate our funders by intervening? They did not. President Bush had been the US permanent representative to the UN. Secretary Baker was determined on seeking a peaceful outcome. And if the UN were to be the mediators, well and good, so long as this man sitting in the front kept a very close eye to ensure that what was going on was fair. I don't know the number of telephone calls, and you can't get those with a freedom of information search. You get the papers, but you don't get the telephone calls. Jim, let's try the next one. Mr. Aronson and the US were determined that talks would only take place if the fighting stopped. But we learned then and have continued that the leverage exercised by guerrilla forces is their ability to return to the fight. Therefore, they will not give up that capacity to fight. And we learned throughout those 22 months that we'd have to fight and talk at the same time. But notice that 
phrase in the background there, la negociación. They rec FMLNA recognize. It was no good just to rely on the guns. You had to talk. Your picture comes up next, Jim. It's not a very good one. Don't you agree the real live is better than this uh, Google pic? <laughs> His role is key. He had to assure the civilian president, Alfredo Cristiani, that Washington would stand behind him in making any agreement with the guerrillas, even though the right wing and even though the armed forces and the high command of the armed forces would rebel, resent, and would seek to change the mind, if not at one or two moments, to dispose of the civilian president. And Assistant Secretary Aronson's role was to ensure the civilian president, we are right behind you. We will not let you down. Now speed it up a bit. Speed it up a bit because, next one please, uh, that's it. The talks seemed to drag on. And deadlines came and deadlines went. But the fundamental issue was that those armed forces had to be purged. The officer corps had to be cleaned up. The size of the armed forces had to be halved. A new civilian police had to be created. A commission to implement the peace, COPAS was formed. Not very effective, but it was there. And then two truth commissions were established. One, a purely Salvadorian commission of three distinguished lawyers in Salvador, whose contents the report has never been published. It's never been leaked. It has remained secret, to my knowledge, Bernie. It is, it is still an exclusive secret document. But the contents of that report said nearly every member of the high command <coughs> must leave his position, including the chief, General Ponce Enrile. And Cristiani had the task of removing them from office, the last 15 of which tried very hard to get rid of it. Despite the prevarication, despite the difficulties, 20 years ago, these men shook hands at Chapultepec Castle in Mexico City. I was amused to see they're nearly all wearing red ties. I didn't know there'd be a, um, a uniform for that day. And then begins the second part of our story, implementing an agreement. Next one, please. A task which was to prove as difficult as negotiating itself. Next one, please. On New Sal, United Nations in El Salvador. Organizaciones de las Naciones Unidas en El Salvador, the acronym for On New Sal. They trained the police. Next. Next slide, please. They trained police, and I had a, did have a slide on decommissioning weapons, but that slipped off. And then we come to a key organization, and one of you today actively participated in it. The next one, Jim. This was a UN effort to find out the truth of what had happened in El Salvador since the murder of Archbishop Romero in 1980 up until 1990. They scoured throughout the whole of the country asking questions of ordinary men and women as to what had happened to them, checking their facts, double-checking their facts, before they wrote the report which was published to the world and which indicated where the massacre had happened and who had carried it out. Names were published. But the President, together with the Congress 
and the legislature, including the FMLNA members, agreed. There would be an amnesty for all those mentioned in this report. This is very controversial today. But Christiani believed that he could not have this international published document by the United Nations, naming names, places, without assuring that those who had been named and had committed the atrocity would not be persecuted, because otherwise you risked falling back to the violence and the counter-violence. But these were the men most seriously affected. And these were the men who at times threatened to push the civilian president to the side. And Bernie Aronson's work to ensure the civilian president that he would not be pushed aside and that the military had to complete, had to carry out the terms of a peace agreement that they himself had signed. And in 1995, the last white UN truck left the country. By that time, our Salvadorian friends did not like the United Nations, nor their trucks. They wanted their own country back, and it was with a sense of relief that Salvador, El Salvador took charge of its own country and its own peace. So this is what they left. But it was a struggle. It was a struggle which is going to take the next generation. And I'm now going to ask the minister at the embassy to take the story from here. I thank you for listening to me. He will respond, and then we'll take your questions. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for being here. For me, it is a great honor to represent Ambassador Alchil at this event, and of course, to hear what uh, this woman, this really good friend of El Salvador who has enlightened us with her comments, with her book on what happened uh, 20 years ago in El Salvador. Uh, for me, it's a great honor to have you here to finally meet Mr. Aronson. Of course, his, 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 he was a very important, a key player uh, representing the United States then in all this process. Let me take this story where uh, Dr. Negroponta left it, and let me, let me tell you, start with a story. I was, that day, uh, starting the university, I'm the next generation, uh, studying journalism in the University of Central America. I entered the university a year after the Jesuits were killed, and um, two years before the, the peace was signed. I do remember being at the central square of San Salvador, we have two central squares actually, Plaza Gerardo Barrios and Plaza Libertad. What we saw that day was unique, and it was history. What we saw that day, the last Salvadorans that were in San Salvador, uh, apart or, or far away from New York, from Washington, where the, all the peace process ending was taking place, what we saw that day was uh, the image of a starting new, new reality. It was, I said, two squares. In Plaza Gerardo Barrios was the FMLN Comandancia, Chafik Handal, Joaquin Villalobos, and the others. And a lot of people that just came off the mountains to be, for the first time in San Salvador, celebrating peace some 200 yards away was the arena party, celebrating. It was an, an accurate repre representation of what was happening. We were, at that moment, not apart as we were before that moment, but we, were, we weren't together. 
we were just starting that process. So when you left, when I left those squares, I was in, the, in both of them. In each one of them, you saw hope. You saw uh, that doubtful hope of what was coming. But there was a lot of skepticism of what was going to happen then. So we entered the post-war. All the first stages of the post-war uh, happened with the ONUSAL um, supervision of the uh, weapons being uh, taken from the FMLN of the first, of the entering to the first presidential election uh, in the new democracy after President Cristiani in 1994, we held the first presidential election with the FMLN. Actually, it wasn't the FMLN, it wasn't a coalition, but the FMLN started to participate actively in politics. Uh, President Calderon Sol from Arena won. He had to go to a second round. Uh, by that time, we were certain that, we're, that it was not going back because we have we had learned that we were tired of the war we we didn't want to go back there but we had a lot of issues to solve but we did achieve not just the end of the war but in 10 years in the in the next 10 years we achieved giving birth to democracy. And that was hard. That was hard because always new. But it was hard mainly because all the war, all those images, those horrible images left a lot of scars in the past generation. So reconciliation was hard, but it happened. And if you ask me, that was the main achievement of this whole process, to bring a nation together. Even though at the first celebration we weren't together, we managed to be together in the next uh, 10 years. Of course, we have a lot of difficulties and differences, but let me uh, go back to, uh, then I became a journalist, and I had the opportunity to interview some of these um, players. And let me uh, tell you two phrases that two of these players told me afterwards. I, I spoke to uh, Mr. De Soto some uh, year and a half ago in New York. And he, he said this, it was clear I had this clear, there was not going back to that. And what you achieved as a country in terms of what the Uni uh, United Nations did, has done in terms of peace processes, has no equal. Another player who's not here, uh, his name is Epigenio Ibarra, he's a Mexican, he was a, a journalist, a war journalist, and I interviewed him, he then became a successful producer for Mexican television, and he said, Sometimes it's, I have a, a lot of friends in El Salvador, and sometimes it's very easy for you, Salvadorans, being here in the day-to-day -day building of this democracy and this peace process to forget the high quality, the greatness of what you achieved, which is peace. So uh, that, I think that's, that was the starting point for the new generation, uh, to walk forward in this. Uh, so one of the main questions Dr. Negroponte asks, uh, us, or asks uh, herself in this book is, do we have peace in El Salvador? The title is Seeking Peace. I would dare to answer, yes, we do have peace. We managed to achieve peace after a horrible war, a 
a really horrible world that tore us apart, that gave us and produced those kind of images. I remember being a kid going to school in San Salvador or in San Miguel watching that. So yes, things have changed. We do have uh, now a lot of things we didn't have then. But of course, we're still seeking peace. We're still seeking peace because we have, in my point of view, two great challenges. One was not touched by the peace accord. And it hasn't be, uh, been touched uh, in the post-war, really. And that is poverty and inequity. We still, and, and Dr. Negro Ponte talks about this in her book, we still a uh, poor country with a high degree of inequity. And that is one of, that is, if you ask me, the main challenge for us to confront as a country. Of course, that's the same challenge a lot of Latin American countries are still uh, have ahead of them. Even the so-called upcoming potent, uh, uh, new uh, powers as Brazil or Mexico or Colombia. And the second challenge is organized crime. Uh, we, if you listen to what uh, President Funes uh, says now is he refers to a new kind of war, as a lot of uh, Latin American presidents have in these past years, the war against organized crime. And that is a huge challenge. And it's a huge challenge because it is, um, it is a, a commonplace and a very large understanding for analysts in El Salvador, both in the right, the left, uh, that this is the threat that could really put at risk our democratic institutions. And this is the threat that, ha that cho chose us every day how weak they still are. So uh, with those challenges in mind, I would like to finish uh, trying to briefly answer, from my point of view, the questions that Dr. Negroponte uh, presents to us at the conclu conclusions of, of her book. She asks herself, how deep, three, three main questions. How deep was the reconciliation between the political parties and within communities in El Salvador? That's one. Had Salvadorans created political space within which to express dissent and to and argue for alternative choices? Uh, that's question number two. And question number three, had institution, institutions necessary for any function in democracies, political parties, the legislative assembly, the Supreme Court, the electoral tribunal, become accountable to the public. Let me start with the two last questions. Have we Salvadorans created political space? Yes, of course. We witnessed another historic milestone a couple of years ago. These guys, this guerrilla, became the government. They got a hold of the power of the, ex the they, they went to hold the executive power. And they took that power from votes. So that is huge. And after that, nobody shot another bullet. Peace still there. Within communities, I think the new generations, and this is, is something I, I, I told Diana before we, uh, we came in, I think the new generations have, the new generation, the generation of the post-war, have a different approach to this. They knew what happened, we know what happened, we knew what happened, we know what happened. Uh, and we're sure, we're pretty sure that we don't wanna go back there. But the, the, the old values that created uh, the war in the first place, the political ideo ideological values, those don't have any sense for us. So that's an opportunity. And within that community, within the new middle class that was created uh, in El Salvador during the whole process, 
I think there's been reconciliation. And, and I think there's an, there are a lot of new spaces. When you go to El Salvador, you get sick of how many open spaces are within the media. You have 18 interview shows in the morning, from the far right to the far left. You can hear whatever you want. And that's huge. Had institutions necessary for any fun uh, uh, functioning democracy become accountable to the pub public? I think that's a, uh, a debt. And this is a debt because, because my view is that that stalemate scenario trespassed the peace accord and got itself into politics. So the two, the two big parties, the FMLN and ARENA, conducted politics with that in mind. So, and they appropriated, uh, uh, they, they took almost property, uh, as a property, the Salvadoran institutions. So now you have a really weak attorney general's office because that's named by Congress. You have a pretty weak um, Corte de Cuentas, which is the, um, uh, how, how can you say this in English? Uh, it's like um, the office that uh, oversees the good spending of government's money. That's a property of the parties. The Supreme uh, Electoral Tribunal, that's property of the parties. The Supreme Court, that's been property of the parties. So there's a lack of presence of civil society still in order to strengthen these institutions. That's a debt that we still have. And finally, how, uh, how deep was the reconciliation? I, I answered that already. I think it's been important. I think it's been uh, deep, but I do think that we still have a lot of uh, a long path to walk. Still, we do have peace. We ho we do have democracy. We do have civil liberties that we didn't have before. But we have these two challenges, and there's a no a very intense discussion within El Salvador if we have finally reached the point in which we need a second generation of agreements. Not to end the war, but to finally start building, building a strong democracy. So that's what we have ahead. And, but my, my, my opinion, I am optimistic. I am optimistic because I go back to what Alvaro Soto told me or, or Epigmenio Ibarra told me. What we achieved was huge. Thank you. Yes, my name is Stephen Davis. I'm a member of the council. I read two stories today which seem to portray different pictures of the direction of the country. I wonder if you would comment on it. One was the institution of tax reforms in the latter part of the year, which seemed to create a more equitable situation for the various classes of, of folks. The second was the shaking up of the cabinet, which appeared to lean towards a perhaps a remilitarization of the government in preparation for fighting the gang wars. Um, is this, it's, it seems one step forward, perhaps two steps back, but I'm not sure if I'm placing this in the proper context. If a country is to engage, to counter the level of violence that El Salvador is going through at the moment, it has to raise the funds from its own people and those with a greater ability to pay through a wealth tax in order to pay for the police force and for introducing the audit systems within that police force, which include polygraphs, 
And therefore, President Funes has emphasized the need to raise those funds, that extra tax, from those in Salvador who should and can afford to pay for it. The second issue is understood only in one sense here in the US, and it has provoked a great deal of debate among civil society. The peace accords emphasize that the leadership of the army of the security should be in civilian hands. The minister now charged with public security is a former military man, General Munguia. He is retired from the armed forces, but his appointment to head up the police and the internal security and his invitation to fellow former officers to join him in this effort has created the impression that you've shared with us this evening. My opinion is that Mungia, whom I do know, is a very effective and democratic individual. But how he will respond to the level of attacks from these gangs, from transnational criminal organizations, and the drug traffickers is yet to be seen. Hello, my name is Julia Cloney, and uh, I'm a development economist. And my interesting question has to do with the position of women in the uh, Salvadorian socioeconomic system and the gender dynamics in the last 30 years. Specifically, did women participate in the civil war, at the negotiations, and were they sort of integrated in the peace building and in society after the civil war? Women are now playing a more prominent role in the political system of El Salvador, but their voice was silent in the 90s. And their voice was needed then because they had the capacity to anchor the peace, particularly in the communities, uh, the rural communities. They fought. They were very effective. They also lost their sons, their husbands, their brothers. They were victims to it. Women today have a very important role in El Salvador. They are strong. Foreign minister was a woman. A number of members of the cabinet are women. And so I salute them and the future that they represent. Uh, my name is Jose Alvarado uh, from an NGO called SERP and Global Women in Salvador. Um, I wanted to, you talked about this in the previous question, but is the role of the military and the police force right now a breach of the peace accords, do you think? Jose, the military are charged with maintaining a peace against external forces. Drug shipments are an external threat. So I would argue that there is a legal justification for using the armed forces on the main arteries of Salvadorian roads and in key intersections but they should not go beyond that. The police fulfill uh, the requirements of the Chapultepec Peace Accords, but they have proved ineffective. The focus on the accords was providing jobs for men who had fought on either the army side or with the guerrillas. They were incorporated into the civilian, the new civilian police, without adequate training. They are therefore, they have therefore not proved capable to the, so far to contain the violence carried out by these youth gangs and by transnational organizations. That is an area where uh, President Funes is focused on strengthening and why he invited General Munguia to take the leadership. So it 
provides this contention as to whether Mungia's appointment to head the police, together with the former retired military that he's brought in with him, is, by the nature of their former positions, in contravention of the agreements? I would say no. My name is Patrick Smythe, and I'm a former member of the World Affairs Council, and I enjoy coming to these. Uh, because I like no, to know what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, we are, uh, the United States uh, is pretty much a um, consumer of the drug traffic that runs mm -hmm. through the uh, Americas. And um, we, uh, of course, you know, there is somewhat of a, more of a middle class growing throughout these countries. Mm -hmm. Um, however, I would assume that most of the uh, drugs that come through the countries or are raised in those countries uh, are used here. Uh, there has been a conversation for legalization um, because of the kind of uh, stuck quality of, uh, of the uh, war on drugs. And I was wondering if there is any conversation in the Latin American countries that uh, directs itself towards that, and uh, are they uh, threatened to some degree by our um, addiction to this problem, as well as you know the issue of uh, you know throughout the world? Right. I guess. Yeah. Patrick, thank you for your question. We ha we hold a shared responsibility for the violence in Mexico and Central America because it is fueled by our appetites. Now, rather than engage on the issue of whether one should decriminalize, legalize, etc., I'd like to share with you what the rules of the game are among the youth gangs called the Mara Salvatrucha and the Barrios Dieciocho. Any member of the gang found intoxicated on heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, or crack is to be disposed of shot. The members of the gang can consume marijuana, but they are not to be so intoxicated they cannot carry out the superior purpose which is that of the criminal enterprises of the gang. So if you have mobs establishing a strict prohibition against the use of strong illicit drugs, that should be, I think, a message for us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.